So I'm John Moody, and what do I do? My wife has been trying to find an answer to that question ever since the day she met, married, well, met me and married me. Um, I do whatever most interests me and I'm passionate about. Um, so I started, at the time my wife and I got engaged, I was actually getting ready for us to move to Canada for me to do a dual PH in ancient Near Eastern history and classics. Um, and obviously you can say I was very successful in that because I'm now sitting here at a homesteading farming conference instead. Um, so so it, it may be you know, a good way to kind of understand who I am and where I am is why I ended up here. So had you met me when I was in college, you would have never ever thought you'd find me here. I was so standard American that I had four food groups, sugar, fruity pebbles, frosted flakes, and cheer, you know, like I, I was video game playing, um, you know, like I, I would walk into a grocery store and see the health food aisle. And in my heart, I would mock the health food, you know, crunchy, tree hugging, nut cracking, strange, Wiccan people, you know, but like just, uh, I mean, I was just like so conventional, standard American, media, consumer driven, just, just the whole nine yards. That was who I, that's just how I grew up, who I was to a core. I had never even grown a weed. Um, so I'd never interacted with animals growing up other than like being mean to them in the park that was right at the end of my street. Um, so it's, it's really strange the people who knew me growing up to see like where I am now. And what happened was, is when I got into master's work, um, I'm in my early 20s working on a master's, and I'd always been pretty sickly growing up. I had seasonal allergies so bad, Benadryl offered me free stock options. Um, but in my early 20s, it got even worse, and I developed duodenal ulcers, um, so which is basically a condition where you have giant open sores in your digestive tract, and it hurts. Like unlike anything I've ever been through. And I've been through a lot of painful things. And so um, I go to a doctor and the doctor looks at me and the doctor says, this is no big deal. Lots of people your age are having digestive issues like this. And we'll just put you on this medicine that you'll probably be on for the rest of your life. And something just snapped. To just, you know, like, like it, there, there's something inside of me. It's just like, this just can't be the way it's supposed to be. Like 20 year olds should not have chronic debilitating conditions that require advanced pharmaceutical involvement just to get through the day. Something's wrong here. And that started my then fiance and I on what has been now a 14 year journey from, you know, eating at McDonald's and Burger King and shopping at Kroger and Walmart to now having a 35-acre farm in the foothills of Kentucky built around regenerative regenerative and permaculture and other principles. Um, and, and so, but, but it started with that health crisis. And, and it also started with a philosophical crisis because at the same time in my master's work, um, I was you know, thinking about in my master's work, um, what, what did it mean to be human? What were humans designed for? Mm -hmm. How were we designed? It always amazes me now looking back and I fall into this category. So when I use this analogy, I'm the, I'm the person on the wrong side of the analogy. But if I walked up to you and said, Hey, I can save you like, you know, 60, 70% on the gas you put in your car. Nobody would ever take you up on that offer because they say, well, it's my car. Like, my car's so expensive. It's so expensive to repair if something goes wrong. And I'm like, your body. But, but like, people, talking clown head gives you food and you eat it right up and think, you know, like, like well, because it's cheap. I save money by eating at the talking clown head. It's your body. Like, you would never do that to your car. But we do that to our bodies. We do that to our ecosystems. And we would, but, but we'd never do it in other areas of life. And it was, and so it was partly health crisis, partly philosophical crisis that 
that drove my wife and I down a path that first led to rethinking our food, where we got it from, how we prepared it, what we even considered food. Um, and then that led to, um, you know, we, we started a food buying club in Louisville, Kentucky um, back in, I guess it was 11 years ago because my daughter's 11. So it would have been, I guess today's 2017, so it would have been 2006. Um, we started a food buying club, five, six other families in the living room of our apartment. Um, and we've now grown to be 200 families. Um, we serve about 30 farmers. We handle half a million dollars or more a year of truly organic, a lot of local, sustainably, regeneratively produced food. Um, so we started the buying club a as a way to access better food for us and our family, but also as a way to draw more people in, get more people talking about these things, get people more passionate about. We really, at the community level, at the local level, we can make a really positive impact for a lot of people by locking arms and focusing on what really matters. Um, in the midst of that, trying to source things for the club, I couldn't find certain things. You know, I'd go to a farmer and say, hey, do you have non-GMO chicken eggs? And they'd look at me like I was crazy. And so we started our farm, um, both to begin to supply some of the things we couldn't find at that time mm -hmm. to the buying club, but also to become a test lab to show other farmers and homesteaders that, man, there are options. There are ways we can do things that you may not know exist, but we know exist. So come and see, you know, come and see what the possibilities are. Um, and, you know, like we have five kids and... Our firstborn daughter, I remember this. Um, I, I, I remember this as, as I'm still sitting in the doctor's office because we're sitting across from the doctor. And um, the doctor, um, we had our baby at home, which, you know, we, I guess we should have had her in a field for, you know, what, what the doctor thought of us having the baby at home. And the doctor goes, I know, I know you all are. Um, um, I, I know you all are kind of crunchy people or whatever the word was 11 years ago. He goes, but just so you know, he goes, in the next couple years, daughter's going to get a runny nose. It's not going to go away. Um, or this or that's going to happen, and you're going to have to put her on antibiotics. And, and so this is a medical doctor, and he looks at me, and I just, I remember looking. He goes, he goes I promise you this. He goes, I guarantee you're going to have to put her on antibiotics. I have five kids. They've lived a grand total of 30 combined years, roughly, at this point. Probably even over. We might even be like to the 32, 33-year total mark. We have not once needed antibiotics. Now, that's not to say that we wouldn't use them if we needed them. Mm -hmm. But it's just to show people, you know, the conventional wisdom of our culture. You have to have antibiotics. You have to use GMOs. You have to use herbicides. You have to be on pharmaceuticals is a lie. It, it, it's a myth perpetuated and forced on the populace because it's really profitable for those who benefit from that myth. You know, because if I convince you your kids need pharmaceuticals, I make money selling you pharmaceuticals. If I teach you how to raise kids that don't need pharmaceuticals and antibiotics, well, I don't get almost anything for that. Um, so, And so the, the hard part about the modern world is an extractive economy is so profitable for the ones who control, you know, who pull all the strings that motivate all the puppets. And then there's people like me running around going, I want to cut your strings. I want you to be free. I started teaching soil and similar subjects a few years ago. Because when we got our farm, farm had less than half a percent organic matter on top of rock-solid limestone. Um, one of my farming friends who came down to the farm and visited said he had never seen worse soil. <laughs> um, and so I was driven by both need and just my personality to figure out how to rapidly and sustainably build large amounts of great quality soil. Um, and, and we have to do this without machination. We don't have tractors. We don't have, to, you know, we have no 
we, we have no machinery on our farm other than a lawnmower. Um, and so now I just got my soil test results back. And if, if the results are right and accurate, um, we have 16% organic matter um, in just you know three, four years. Um, and so I was really excited to teach people like there are all these waste streams, you know, uh, this, this resort probably produces, you know, a hundred tons of coffee grounds a year, a cubic yard of coffee grounds is 500 pounds of organic matter that's going in a landfill being mixed with car batteries and, you know, plastic diaper and, and just all, and I'm like, we can sequester these waste streams and build up our farms and our soils and produce nutrient-dense food just as we're driving through town. You know, you have to go to town anyway. While you're there, why not collect 1,000, 2,000 pounds of organic matter and save it from going somewhere that it can never be reclaimed? So I started teaching um, here at Mother Earth News, at Weston A. Price and other conferences on soil and um, holistic. Um, we developed on our farm some really neat ways to control bug populations. We had really bad flies the first year. So I'm like, there has to be a way to control flies. And everybody says, well, there's a way to control flies. You use pesticidal ear tags. And I'm, I'm like, no, I'm like, there has to be a way to like work with nature, understand what the problem is and turn the problem into a solution. Um, and so we developed ways to control flies and other stuff, totally using other animals and other systems to turn a problem into a profit. Um, where, you know, now instead of having huge fly outbreaks, I have all this free food for my chickens. And like, man, that's just great. And, and I'm getting extra value out of the things I'm doing. So I started teaching. I met Dan. And we love these conferences. We're so thankful for what Mother Earth News and others do. But the conferences are always limiting. Mm -hmm. The best I can do is give you a 40-minute slide presentation with some cool pictures of how I do things. And to bring people to farms, I love when people come visit, um, but you know, on-farm classes are really expensive for people to go to, because you know, they have two, three days of hotel, mm -hmm. they have hundreds of miles of travel. Um, for me to make a farm class worth my time, I have to charge people a couple hundred bucks to be there. Um, I have a bunch, you know, a bunch of prep work. It's disruptive to farm life. It's disruptive to homeschool. You know, like it's it's a lot to do these farm classes, and it's really expensive for the participants. And depending on your view of climate change and fossil fuels, you know, then you're also moving people around all this distance and using all of this energy for a four-hour farm class. And Dan and I were like, if in, if instead of trying to move people around everywhere. Why don't we just move two people to the farm, have them stay there a few days, and in, in a really immersive, inspirational, educational way, create the classes where they can access them from wherever they are. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to learn soil from me, you can take my soil class. And instead of it being a slideshow, it is fully immersive on my farm for a few hours where you see exactly how we do solarization. You see exactly how we handle staggering plantings and, and all of these other things to where you can really learn, um, but you can also be inspired and just be like, wow, like look at what, you know, if John could, because if I can do this, anyone could do this. Because again, like I have no background, I have no skill set, I have no green thumb. And like if, if John can do this, what can we do with our land and farm? And so that's what Stetter basically is. It's a, it's a platform where people can connect with instructors. We call them guides, and we call the classes paths, where you can connect with guides who will help you learn wide sets of skills, but right where you are, and in a way you can really digest and take in and then apply. So right now, the place we're at with the platform is we got enough seed money to shoot five or six starting classes. And we're using those five and six starting classes on a Kickstarter that's running from now until probably around October 13th. Um, so because the Kickstarter runs for 30 days. 
And our goal in that Kickstarter is to raise another $10,000. And the incentive for listeners during the Kickstarter is you get to lock in basically a half price rate on all of these classes. And you also get to help us develop further classes and choose. And with that $10,000, we're going to shoot another six classes. And those 12 classes should show enough traction for us to bring in additional investment and support. And as soon as we have enough additional investment and support, we hire a full-time videographer and we start producing, you know, 10 hours a month of content and we move to a subscription service because our goal is to make this as affordable as possible um, while it's profitable. And by profitable, um, you know, the platform has to sustain itself. But what, what really mattered to Dan and I is I, I was at lunch today with a few other speakers and they were all joking about that books, they don't make any money doing books. Um, so we have all these great speakers and teachers who are really scraping by doing what they do. And so one of the, one of the core tenets of Stetter is the platform's not successful if it doesn't make the instructors financially stable. If everybody doesn't thrive and do well from what you're doing, then it's really not regenerative. It's really not permaculture. We want, we want all the participants to benefit. So we didn't want to create a platform where the platform was going to make all these money off of these people's content. We wanted a platform where they would say, I want to teach there because they're going to do right by me because they want to see me do well. Uh, but we also want it to be affordable. So as soon as we have sufficient content, we want to move to a subscription base where for $14 a month, you'll have full access to hundreds of hours of content across all different disciplines and areas of farming and homesteading and sustainable living and things. And, and that's what really excites us is being able to have that kind of depth available to people at an affordable price point. So I think there'd be a few things. So one is um, things are probably going to get harder before they get easier with where our culture is, with where things are. Um, and, and so it's hard not to be discouraged. Um, so, you know, like I live in a rural farming area and every day I drive by thousands of mismanaged acres. And, and it's just, you know, Becoming discouraged, becoming bitter, becoming defensive, becoming combative isn't the way to win our neighbors. Um, and and I, have, I have a neighbor who's one of the largest conventional farmers in the area, and I'm trying to work out a deal with him. He bought an organic blueberry orchard. Um, and his, his wife is very crunchy. It's really strange. Like, they, you know, they raise tobacco, cattle, and grain, all conventionally, and he bought a blueberry orchard. But he has no idea how to manage it. He has, he has no framework for that. And so I don't have any equipment, and I have some pasture that needs remediated. So I'm trying to build, and, and everybody in my community knows, like, I'm the weird one who knows about this. Like, the only weird one in our entire community. And so I'm trying to build a bridge with him where, hey, like, I actually need you. I could really use your equipment for a couple days on my farm, and I would love to help you understand how to manage a blueberry orchard in a way that is going to really be good for all the participants involved. And there's things we can do for those of us who are farther along where, where we can begin to build bridges because we're, we're about to, um, we're coming up on the great exchange, I think is what some people are calling it, where it'll be the greatest exchange of land in America's history since the founding of America as a nation. Mm -hmm. You know, hundreds of millions of acres of land are going to be changing hands. And if all we've done is burn bridges instead of build them, no more land is going to fall into the hands of people who of are, of, are the kind of people we want to. So we really need to take the time to find ways to build bridges with those who we may not completely agree with if we want to have any opportunity to really change that system. 
And, you know, for the people who are just starting out, um, you know, seek out good mentors, seek out good teachers, seek out good opportunities and, and see what we've done, but then do not at all be afraid to question, iterate and improve. Um, because because that that's that's the only way we move things forward. Don't don't take any teacher as someone who has arrived. The the best teachers know they are only students, and I measure my success as a teacher just like I measure my success as a parent by being eclipsed by those who come after me. <laughs>